Welcoming Nolan to the Hall of Fame are Nate Tiny Archibald and John Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, Nolan Richardson. Thank you. <clears throat> to start off with, uh, my wife could not attend here tonight, even though we're here in the hotel. She's just not uh, feeling very well. But I do have some family members here. And to start off, I would like to introduce them. My daughter, Madeline. My great-granddaughter. Somebody looked at that. I got a great-granddaughter. She's a cheerleader. Alizé. My nephew. Oscar. My nephew is Oscar. And a great buddy of mine who helped me, which I will talk about in, as we go along, Andy Stoglin. Before I get started, I want to first of all say thank John. I appreciate Cheney. I wanted him up here, but he's not feeling very well. But I admire Big John. You know, he was. When I got to, to the to Tulsa University, and when I was a junior college coach, John was a major college coach doing his thing to me. And I admired his team so, so much because they played so hard. Physically, they played hard. And I, you know, I, I know that Vince Lombardi would say, fatigue will make cowards of us all. And, and I saw John's teams make cowards of the teams he played. And I, I enjoyed that. And so when I think of John McClendon, who ran the fast break better than anybody ever ran it, and I, I copy those things and put that in my repertoire. And John, I, I just want to thank you for being who you were, who also never backed off of no one at any time. That was important to me. I needed someone as I was coming out to be the college coach that I could look up to. And Cheney was in that same, same group. Now, I don't think George is here, but George Ravelin, those guys, they're old timers. But those are the guys that I, I had to have. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank uh, Tiny Archibald. I go back with Tiny. Tiny played for the same coach I played for, Coach Haskins. He's a Hall of Famer. I'm very proud. I, I, I'm, in the, I'm going into the hall with a man that's in the hall already, who was a great, great basketball coach. But Tiny, I use him all the time. I said to players who tell I don't get enough touches. I said, go talk to Tiny. Hell, you know what he did? He not only won the NBA scoring title, he also was the best assist man during the same year. Now, how in the hell can that happen? <laughs> now, think about what I just said. Think about it. I said, so from now on, go rebound, damn it, and then you can shoot all you want. <laughs> you know? Let me tell you something. Going back, I'll never forget driving, and I'm listening to a game. It's New Mexico State playing Indiana State. I don't really care about the game, but I, New Mexico State is right up the streets from El Paso, and I went to UTEP. And we're big rivalries. So I'm 
hoping that Indiana State will beat New Mexico State. And I'm listening to the radio, and I have no clue of the players on either team. All of a sudden, this name keeps coming. Bert, he goes to the right. Bert, he makes the swipe. Bert. I said, God damn, who is Bert? <laughs> Bert. You know, here's Bert. And Bird this and, and Bird just, oh, did you see the pass that Bird made? I can't see it, but I'm just trying to imagine it. And I, I, when the time I got to the end, I said, damn, that brother can play. <laughs> damn that brother. Hey, let me tell you something. When I got the newspaper, the next morning and saw Larry's picture, I said, damn. <laughs> Woo! Larry, they wasn't you, you, you know, be honest with you. The young lady that said you were her favorite player, mine too. I love you too, Magic, but not as much as I like Bird. I have to tell you this because my grandfather and my grandmother was so important in my life. I was about 10 years of age and my grandfather said, son, you got to believe. And he's had some preaching in him. And you can tell I got a little bit in me too. <laughs> he said, you, whatever you do, you got to believe in him. And that was his voice. You got to believe. He said, let me tell you the story about this little boy. He was 10 years old. And back in our days, we used to buy pop bottles. And some of you guys I see out there, you're about as old as I am. You remember the pop bottles you could get a deposit of two pennies off of? You take the bottles back to the store and they gave you two pennies for the bottle that you already paid for. <laughs> you remember that? Okay. This little boy saved up all the bottles around the neighborhood. It rained, it snowed, he had a little red wagon. And that wagon sit outside. And he went through all this weather. And summer come, it's May, he's got him on quite a few bottles saved up. He takes those bottles and put them on his wagon, and he's got schools out. It's May, beautiful. And he's taking them across to sell those bottles. And all of a sudden, one of the wheels got kind of moving, and it popped off, which overturned the wagon. Bottles fell. Some of them broke. The little boy said, damn. <laughs> I'm looking at my granddad. He said, yeah. He said, then he looked at the little, there was a preacher on the corner that heard him say that. And he walked over to him in his reverently voice. And I got a great Monsignor over there. He understands what I'm talking about. He said to him, son, you have to believe. Don't use that word. Instead of saying that word, look into the heavens and say hallelujah. And then say, I believe. And then you got to believe. The little boy said, yes, sir. So he says, pick up the remainder of the bottles that you have and put that wheel back on the wagon and get on across that street and get them sold. So he did that. He picked the bottles up, put them on the wagon. He says, and remember, you must believe. So the little boy was on his way, and the wagon started shaking. And he looked up into the heavens, and he said, I believe. Ain't nothing going to happen. I believe this wagon's going to make it. I believe this. And all of a sudden, boom! <laughs> Overturned. He was getting ready to say something, and all of a sudden, the wheel jumps back on the wagon. Boom! The bottles that broke down the street was fixing in the air coming back <laughs> on the wagon. The little boy looked down at the preacher and he said, damn. <laughs> he said, son, just remember he's the messenger. That's all the preacher was. So when we won the national championship, I was 
I hadn't preached about believing. Shit, I was like this. <laughs> God has blessed me in many ways, and all honors go to him. When I stopped to think about going into the hall, and I want to thank the hall, all the committee, now, I want to also have a special thanks for Fran. Everybody, give her a fan, Fran. You know, I've always believed that you, you have to have a, a team to reach a dream. A lot of folks don't understand what I'm saying, but you have to have a team to reach a dream. Everybody can dream and never reach it. But if you've got a team, you can. You can reach it. And it's not talking about a national championship team. I'm talking about the team that helped raise Nolan Sam Richardson Jr. And who was that team? That team, to me, was my teachers. When I started out the school, elementary school, my teachers in high school, my coaches, junior high, high school, my college. I went to junior college, and I also played for the legendary coach Don Haskins, who had a lot to do with who I, the way I approached the game. And the reason is because when I met him, I helped him move into his house. And he decided that he wanted to have an interview with me, which is a meeting. And he said to me, I understand you're a good football player. And I said, yes, sir. You are the leading scorer on this minor basketball team. You're averaging 21 points a game. I said, yes, sir. I was really, you know, he, he knows I averaged 21 points because I was shooting it every time I touched it. <laughs> Damn right, I'm going to the B team. So, he said, yes, and I understand, I understand you, you turned down a baseball contract. I said, yes, sir. You, I'm saying, wow, I was a pretty good athlete. I, was, <laughs> I didn't know anybody better than me, to be honest with you. <laughs> Not in any sport, okay? So he said to me, he said, but I also heard that you can't guard a damn telegraph post. Now here it is, I'm the leading scorer. I came to, it was a coach before him. I came to that coach to be a scorer, and he telling me that I gotta guard somebody? I didn't think that was right. <laughs> so he coached me from averaging 21 to 14, and my senior year, I averaged 10. But you know what I found out though? We won. I didn't know I liked winning that much, but we won. So he introduced me to the rest of the team, said, hey, this is a guard on your team, this is enough forward. <laughs> Hell, I didn't know there was any other player but me. But I found out at that time, I said, hey, if I can play like this and coach like I want to coach and not look at the book and be a book coach, Everybody out there in the fans are all coaches. Everybody. My wife, she's a point guard. She point out every damn thing I do wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, people. I am very proud. Tonight is a night of thank you. That's what the night is for me. And when I start to thinking of the people that I must thank, I got to thank the man that gave me the first opportunity. His name was Frank Pollitt. He's been gone a long time. I'll never forget. I went to Bowie High School, and I went back there to be a school teacher. And I never forget him bringing me into the office. He says, I'm going to start you. That school was 7th through 12. So I'm going to start you in the 7th grade. 
and I'll move you if you prove that you can teach and coach. And at that school was basically Mexican-American kids. I went to school there. I remember when I first went to school there, they integrated. I was one time the only black on the campus. But I spoke Spanish better than they did. <laughs> he said, if the head coaching job ever opens, I want you to think about what you want to coach. Well, see, I had played football, basketball, and baseball. So he said to me, I said, well, football. I'd like to be a football coach. He said, oh, no. Not in my lifetime or yours <laughs> will you be a football coach, not at this school. And I start thinking, why? He says, son, he just was straight up with me. That's why I loved him. He says, there are no black coaches in football ever in El Paso. There are none in basketball. He says, but in baseball, I just might be able to push you through there without a whole lot of fanfare. I said, okay. So for two years, that's what I did as a seventh grade. Then they moved me to the eighth grade. Then they moved me to the ninth grade. And then finally the varsity basketball job came open. And Jay Clay Cox was a very close friend to the principal and he was my football coach in high school. He called me, he says, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna go in there and talk to him for you. Mr. Pollitt called me and he says, Nolan, I'm gonna make you our head basketball coach. I was 26 years old. Happiest time of my life. He says, hey, I'm gonna be the coach at Bowie. If you knew what the school, the tallest kid was five foot 11. When I went there, I was 6'1", and I was the tallest guy on the campus <laughs> playing center when I knew I was a point guard like magic. <laughs> you know? But anyway, he called me and he says, we're going we're gonna to get it done. I felt so good and so proud that I had this man behind me, had my back, because he was the principal. As I moved up, I moved in to, to thank the junior college. I never forgot, I never will forget the man that gave, gave me the opportunity to show that I'm pretty good at what I do. There were 50 JCs in the state of Texas, 50. And there was not one African American coaching as a head coach. Dr. Simpson was his name. He was the athletic director. It's funny, he told me, he says, now Nolan, <laughs> if you don't do well, me, you, and the president are gonna have to buy a ticket and get out of this damn place. <laughs> Snyder, Texas. That's a challenge to me. Are well, we gonna do all right? Because if I don't do good, there won't be anyone following us. I got that from Granny. Why I get that from Granny? Because I did not want to go to a town because they wouldn't let me stay in a hotel with my teammates. So I told them, I'm not going. The coach came and told my grandmother that I wasn't going. And she says, oh no, he's not old enough to make decisions like that. <laughs> she called me in and said, I need to talk to you, son. And it's funny, old mama was very smooth. She said, I'm going to tell you something. You remember Jackie Robinson? Oh, she loved Jackie Robinson. I said, yeah, I remember. You remember, this? You remember what he did? I said, yes, ma'am. You got to do the damn same thing. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was gone. I didn't like it. That's why I said, she said, crack the doors all you need, son. You can take care of the rest yourself. It's all about attitude. Force your attitude on the people you deal with. Let them see through you, see through your eyes to where you need to go and where you need to be. 
That was a beautiful teaching. Oh, Granny was something very, very special. I get a kick out of these parents today saying, we need role models, bullshit, excuse my friend. <laughs> I'm sorry. We need parents. We need parents that our kids can look up to and say, that's what we need. Emory Turner, no black people and no coaching, nowhere in Oklahoma. I got the Tulsa job. You should have seen my resume. I said, if you want to win, you need Nolan Richardson. Boop, that was it. <laughs> I mean, I've been turned down anywhere, so I said, hey, I ain't going to waste all this. You know, I did this, I did that. I, oh, yes, I, no, 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 you need, you need me. I, I can change all that stuff. We changed it, too, that first year. First of all, in order for me to do right, I had to go get my main man, Andy Stoglin. Andy was working at San Diego State, making pretty about 24000 a year. I had 18000 in my budget. I said, Andy, I need you. He said, I'll be there. I said, I don't have no money. He says, I'll be there. So we started that program. And of course, later on, he went to Southern University in Jackson State. But that's how it started. But that man gave me the opportunity at Tulsa, and I had a man to come and help me. I got to Arkansas. There was Frank Royals. He opened the door. So therefore, if he opens the door, it gave me a chance to go into the South and try to do what I thought was a little bit different than what everybody else did. And why did I change the way I wanted to play? It's been always the question asked. I remember passing the ball, passing it, and getting beat 21 to 27, 28 to 32. But we were losing. I said, damn, I'm tired of losing. I got to figure out something else. We didn't run. We ran the plays. Oh, my God. They'd, all the old coaches that beat me, they would say, man, you, your team is very well coached. You're, you're, you're really getting good, man. I mean, God, I've never seen anything like that. That's, but I was losing. I didn't like that. And then I start biting, grabbing, slapping, trying to cre create turnovers try to win the possession war. They didn't know all about those things. If I can win the possession war and get more opportunities to shoot layups, I got a chance. That's all I needed was a chance. And that year, i never forget, we were so bad that never in the history of El Paso, no high school team had won 30 games. I did it with a, with a team that didn't have a six, nobody six feet on it. It's so different today. I thank those people for giving me that opportunity. There are some special people here tonight that have come a while, a long ways to, to celebrate with me, with me. There's a guy that I coached his son in junior college, Joe Rosales, Jaime Rosales. They came a long ways. And a spiritual leader, Monsignor Smith. I'm so so indebted to Monsignor Smith, I lost a daughter. He presided over that funeral in 1987. No one knows how hard that was and trying to coach and trying to win. If I could have threw away basketball, which I almost did because of that tragedy, she died of leukemia at the age of 15, in the prime of her life. And I'm trying to coach a basketball team for the first time at Razorbacks. It was unbelievable pressure, unbelievable feelings. I could care less if we ever won anything. And then I reached up and asked the good man upstairs, what should I do? 
I know she wouldn't want me to quit. So I rededicated myself again. I think in terms of winning, sometimes you do things for the ones you love so much. And I dedicated that all the time in my heart for what she had to put up with to win a championship. Was I happy? A little bit, but it was different. Things went into right perspective at that time. What's more important, a life or a game? That's what I was faced with. And I would pick life every time. It's a lot more important than any game I've ever been in. In closing, there's another young man that I think, I, he wrote a book called 40 Minutes of Hell. Brad, Bradbury. Spent a lot of time putting that book together. Brought a lot of good things to light. Didn't make me look like a hero either, and I didn't like that worth of crap, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not perfect. The only perfect one that's ever supposedly lived here don't live here no more. But I, I want to thank him. I want to thank guys like Judge Wendell Griffin during the tribulations and tough times, uh, being able to talk to someone, going through a trial, going through uh, all kinds of things that, that makes this such a great honor to me. I remember a guy once called me in and said, you'll never make it to the hall for what you did. I said, then I don't make it to the hall if that's what it is. If what I did was wrong, I don't deserve to be in the hall. That, that's who I am. I only hope and pray that whatever I receive was what I was supposed to receive. Simple as that. And so when I say it is a night of thank you, I want to thank, again, all my college mates, all my teachers. I'd be up here all night developing the team that made me reach the dream. That's how I see it. The team that made me reach a dream. In closing, I got one more short story to tell you. <laughs> because of Delaney, where's Delaney? The official? Thank you. You can sit down now, just, you don't have a whistle. <laughs> sit down. A guy asked me, Coach, you, you were rough on the officials. I said, you know why? Why? I said, let me tell you a story that was told to me down in Mexico when I was coaching. Many years ago, I'm saying that. It supposedly there was going to be a game between heaven, the good man upstairs, and the bad man, the devil, downstairs. He kept calling the good man upstairs, hey, I want a game. The good man says, no, you can't win. He said, what do you mean I can't win? He said, let me tell you something. You know who I have up here? Besides Whit Wilt Chamberlain. You know who else I have up here and who I can call up at any time? Now, that's powerful. He can call up anybody at any time. Woo -hoo. And you still want to play a game? The devil said, yeah. He said, what makes you so strong? He says, all the officials are down here. <laughs> all down here. <laughs> That's why I don't like them. No, in all seriousness, Delaney, you you were one of the great ones, and uh, there's a lot of them that are great. People I thoroughly am pleased and thoroughly enjoy the fact that I'm, I can s say, hey, Larry Bird, oh, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a fraternity brother. 
Magic? Oh, man, we, we can rub elbows. They named a school in El Paso after me called Nolan Ritson Middle School. This was 10 years ago or 12. And I never forget my granddaughter was a little girl. And when they told the story of who I was, she was there, she started crying. <laughs> I said, hey, Erica, be quiet. <laughs> be quiet. What's the matter? She said, Grandpa, you're going to die. <laughs> I'm going to die? Yeah. They only name things after people who's dead. <laughs> God bless y'all and have a great night.